Greetings to you all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Shall we pray? Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we continue to come before your throne of grace. We continue to exalt the name of the Lord. We continue to ask for grace and mercy as we learn about altars. May you give us spiritual ears so that we can hear. May you give us understanding so that we understand the word and we are able to practice it in our daily lives. Thank you, O Lord, for your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. We bless your name. We glorify your name. We honor you. There is no other name besides your name. May you be exalted in our lives. This we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are now entering into the third part of our series on altars. We are going to talk about a human solution to a spiritual problem. To begin with, we spoke about a defiled altar where we looked at what happened at Shiloh. Then we, are, we went into um, inherited cases. So now we are going to talk about a human solution to a spiritual problem. We are going to read from 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4 to 7. Israel asks for a king. I shall read from verse 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah and said unto him, Behold, you are old, and your sons walk not in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. I'll repeat verse 7. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. So Israel rejects God in favor of their own king. This is the story that we are looking at. So this continuous decay was seen in the children of Eli. It also moved down the line to corrupt the children of Samuel. So evil Altars which continue to exist and to speak into a foundation will grow in depth and influence. So basically we are saying that power is getting more and more and influencing deeper and deeper issues in the life of a person, in the life of a system, in the life of a church. It was not enough to affect the children of priests and of prophets. The devil wants to continue to have influence to the highest office. So the Israelites therefore reached a new law by demanding that God vacate his position as their ultimate leader, king and God. The more we let a case grow, the more influence it is on greater areas of our lives. A people which has defiled, a defiled altar ceases to respect hierarchy or the importance of God in all its administration levels. The elders of Israel, they were present during the time of Eli and they saw Ophni and Phineas what, he, what they did to defile the altar of God. Well, Eli did nothing to prevent this, or to stop them, or to admonish them, or to even mention anything. He just paid a blind eye. So next, these elders of Israel were also there when Samuel appointed sons, his own sons as judges. And the same problem which happened in Eli, with Eli's son, sons cropped up. So the elders then felt that the old way of doing things was no longer relevant to their present context. They say to themselves, we have to upgrade the way things are done here. 
We will not wait until Samuel is blind. As what happened with Eli. Who continued to actually serve in the house of God and paying a blind eye to his children's vile behavior. Their thoughts on the matter were important. It was, these were important issues to say, what do you do when people misbehave in the church? But I have got a problem with the solution. The solution suggested does not answer to the gap or the need that has been created. When they say to Samuel, to Samuel, you're old. When they say to him, you're old, they are alluding to the ancient system which was there during Eli's time and which continued in Samuel's time. Even though Samuel had come in with the prophetic and the judgmental to, to, to top of the priestly anointing. So Samuel had gone a step further from the priesthood to the prophetic, to the judge era. But the elders are saying that system, that ancient system of the law and the prophets is outdated. So the Israelites decided to weigh their options and use reason to influence a new world order. It is a case of the blind leading the blind when you think that you are solving things without consulting God, you are making things worse. Like I said, this is the hierarchy of the Israelite nation. These are the elders that have come together and agreed that the solution, the best solution to all these problems is a king, a human king. I'm going to read from 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. Samuel anoints Saul. Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zerah, the son of Bekorath, the son of Aphia, a Benjamite, a mighty man of God. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and handsome. And there was not among the children of Israel a more handsome person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. I want us to look at the qualities of a soul. These are the qualities that the people chose over the qualities that God chose, chooses for us. So to replace the qualities that God wants, there are three qualities that the people wanted, and these qualities are found in Saul. The first one, the outward appearance. The second one is the power and presence. The third one is the ability to listen to the people. So these are the three qualities that were desired by the Israelites in a king or in anyone who's supposed to be watching over them. So when they wanted God to move, they wanted a person who come in and have possessed these three qualities. And to them, these were the best qualities that were necessary. So the look of a man was important to them. One had to look the part of a king. One had to have a perfect, powerful posture. And it is said that Saul was head and shoulders above all the people of Israel. So this aspect of being head and shoulders above the, everyone else is symbolic of power of, and influence. We learn in verse 1 of, of chapter 9 that Saul was a, def, a descendant of a powerful and mighty man. There were mighty men in the dynasty of, of of Saul. So the last condition or quality of their chosen king, which was more important than all the other two that I've mentioned, was the ability of the king to listen to the people and to allow himself to be influenced by the people. The people felt that God did not listen to their needs. 
to their voice, to what they wanted. God was more of instructing to say, do this, do that. I don't want this, I don't want that. So by replacing God with a person, they wanted a person with the ability to listen and follow after what they wanted themselves. So this was now a people-led uh, uh, kingship. So now let us go back a bit and look at the issue of inherited traits or cases as we are looking at Saul. Does he have the qualities or the, 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 has he inherited something from this altar that we are saying is speaking into the life of every generation? Because at this point, that altar has not been broken. No one has made declarations to break the powers of that altar, to break the influences of that altar into the generation. So let us look and see, do we have those traits that we're speaking of? So there are inherited traits of a priest in Saul. I'll give an example. At one point, Saul offered sacrifices in place of, of Samuel. So the prophetic mantle, the traits of a prophetic mantle are also seen when Saul joins the son of prophets in prophesying. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 24. So he could prophesy, he was also a priestly person because he inherited those things from the foundation, from the other people that came in line with him. But because these traits were oppressed, because the people did not choose them but chose human qualities instead, these traits were cursed on Saul, and they were not a blessing, they were a curse on, upon Saul. So what transpires is that the power which leads to self-praise and self-trust, since God is out of the equation, that is what takes over the throne. That is what took over the throne. When power is important, it overrides everything else. So Saul so, so, so does not see the importance of Samuel. There's no respect for Samuel because the people are saying, you have failed. Move over and then we have a king of our own. So the king that comes in is coming in to replace the system that was there. The issue of respect of exiting offices or officers does not exist because they are saying, no, you did things wrong. Now we have this new system that is going to correct everything. So why should we respect you? So this is why uh, Saul is disobedient to God and does what he sees fit. And he also shuns consultation as he sees it as limiting and delaying whatever he wants to achieve. So he does not consult the prophet of God. He does not consult God. He consults the people that have put him in that place. So Saul values the views of the people because it, because it is people who chose him. It was not God who chose uh, Saul. So everything that he does is meant to keep the popularity rate high. He seeks the approval of people. Let's, let us look at that on 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 24. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. So what was important to Saul or what was important to this new leadership was listening to the voice of the people as another quality. So when a defiled altar exists, it slowly drains the presence of God, not only in the temple, but in every area of the church. Slowly, slowly, human reason takes over. And the place of God is actually not found. And yet we say the church belongs to God. 
Let us look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 19 to 22, as we conclude. Revelation chapter, 19, chapter 2, verse 19 to 22. To the church in Thyatira, I know your works and love and service and faith and your patience and your works and the, and last, and the last to be more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tri tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Here I'm also giving an example of what traits are inherited along the line. Let us also look finally at 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. Overseers and deacons. This is a true saying. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy, of money but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that rules well his own house, having his children in subjection with all respect. For if a man knows how to rule his own house, sorry, for if a man knows not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? We must therefore include God in every plan, whether it is great or small. By doing this, we are placing God in the center of all our plans so that he blesses and approves our strategies. The more we move away from the influence of God, the more the body of Christ moves away from godliness. And our interactions stop being about God, but begin being about the needs of the self. We must place God on the throne and everything else must kneel before him. This is if we intend to demolish the evil altars in our midst and to walk with God in everything we do. Let us pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we come before you. We come before you as children. We have seen the destruction that has happened in the body of Christ. We come before you and ask for your mercy. We ask for divine intervention. May the fire of the Lord burn to ashes every wickedness in the altars that are speaking against us. May the altars be cleansed. May our altars be cleansed, O oh Lord. Intervene in every area of our life. Intervene in every level of our administration. Be the voice that speaks in everything that we do. O oh Lord, intervene. This is your church. We are your people. And we bow down to the will of God. We bow down to the will of God and we refuse to bow down to our own will. We refuse to use our own influences. We refuse to be led by our personal interests. Father, we bless your name. We thank you and we glorify your name. For you have taught us that we should put you back on the seat of glory so that you are the leader of this great church, so that you are the one who leads everything. And we do not place ourselves in these positions, but we place you as the leader and king and lord of our lives. We bless your name, we glorify your name, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.